Hey everybody, and welcome to a very exciting and fun episode of Popcorn Dogs. Uh, we are, of course, part of Hair the Dogcast, your favorite podcast about video games and beer. And Popcorn Dogs is our newer movie and TV section of the show, and it hasn't been going on that long, and we haven't done the time to earn such a cool guest today. <laughs> My name is Brad, and we are part of the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Check out all those other amazing shows. Who else do we have here today? I'm Tyler. Um, yeah, we're uh, we're excited to be doing more popcorn dogs. I like doing popcorn dogs a lot. Uh, Brad and I both went to film school, so that kind of makes it a little special. Yes, and like everyone who goes to film school, we were bartenders. And yes, <laughs> and now I work in the service industry. Um, but yeah, we have a, a very cool guest today. Uh, someone whose work I admire very much. We are joined by the wonderful Jamie Flanagan. Oh, thanks, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Jamie, where might our, uh, some of our listeners know you from? Uh, the Haunting of Blind Manor, Midnight Mass, um, Midnight Club, The Fall of the House of Usher, which comes out in October, and the new season of Creepshow, season four, which I know has been long anticipated, is also hopefully going to drop around September, October. Now, I have questions and thoughts about everything you just said. So naturally, we're going to start with... You're a video gamer, aren't you? Very much so. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've seen you posting on Twitter about it, and I wanted to ask you, like, um, can I hear a little bit about, can you tell us about your uh, history with video games? Yeah, you know, I started on the Atari 2600, Space Invaders, Pitfall, um, you know, the classics, I guess. And then from there, we got a Nintendo Entertainment System, which was grand. After that, it was Sega Genesis. We skipped the Super Nintendo era and uh, N64. I never had one of those. Okay. So I missed a whole bunch of games. Missed GameCube. Um, I went from what, Genesis to Sega CD. Oh. And then from Sega CD to the first PlayStation. I had kind of a lapse there for a minute. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I've, I've been gaming ever since. And it's been a, just sort of a something that I go to for comfort and fun. It is a good way to unwind. Uh, we have somehow made it into uh, not only a, something we get to do for fun, but like a passion. And it's you appreciate art more when there's like you have to talk about it and you have to have thoughts about it and put some research into it. Yeah, it's like a second job now. Like, in, in, I, work, I work a full time job, but like I like this job a lot more. Yeah, it's when I'm willing to research the lore of Street Fighter for a few hours, I'm, and I'm, I'm playing that down. It was more than a few hours. <laughs> yeah, you know, I even when I don't have a system, I, uh, I'm notoriously squeamish when it comes to horror games. I, I can't play them, uh, but I love watching them on YouTube and playthroughs, like uh, all of the Amnesia games. I haven't played a single one, but I've seen the whole franchise played. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's a natural question. I was going to ask you like horror games, but you don't you don't play most of them? No, 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 no. They having agency in those moments uh, really screws with me. I think that's what I love about um, horror film and, and horror television is that I feel that I'm in safe hands. And usually I am with a, a creators that have sort of tailored this thing to make sure that it has meaning and um and that, you know, I'll be taken care of at the end of the day. I'll, I'll walk up to the line of something that really frightens me, mm -hmm. but I'll walk away alive and feeling like I've learned something or faced something and gotten more courage. Whereas in video games, the first time I saw a death screen animation, I was out. <laughs> it's like, I <laughs> do not feel safe here. I'm gone. I so. get scared enough in Mario games, but I remember playing Resident Evil 7 mm -hmm. in VR. You did VR, Resident Evil 7? V How'd, oh, God. VR. Uh, so it's weird because you actually get that, like, 3D perspective, which 3D cinema doesn't do much for me generally. But there's something about perceiving a 3D space. And when a character walks up with, like, an axe or you're sitting at that, like, dinner table and someone leans in and you can feel their perspective, it's very odd. And I th I'm like, I must be... I'm almost done with this game. And I just, I checked a guide because I was like, I got to know. And they're like, you are through chapter one. <laughs> I was like, no. Not even close. I can't keep going on with this. You made it through what, <laughs> Mia and the Barbarous family. And now you're outdoors and good luck. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I quit the VR. And then I'm like, all right, well, I'm very happy playing this game normal mode and still being uh, scared enough. It's yeah. Uh, moving through that space is much different than having a controlled environment. Yeah, yeah. I, I can only imagine I would never put on a, a headset to play re7 like I, again <laughs> I, I watched the playthroughs a friend of mine uh, digital lozenge over on twitch played through it and um i usually turn to him whenever i, I want to play a game but don't want to play a game yeah and yeah you know he's he's kind of 
he's kind of hardened to these things. He's been playing these games for ages, you know, especially the horror ones and especially Resident Evil. And yeah, he has a thick skin that I I really admire but cannot emulate. <laughs> yeah, you gotta want to punish yourself a little bit. Mm. Oh, a lot of it. Those <laughs> games are terrifying. Yeah, you gotta psych yourself up. Like I don't know if I want to play Resident Evil Four for a while. I think I'll just wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I beat out last one and two, and I'm not ready for the next one. And that I should be a seasoned vet at this point. Yeah, my partner and I uh, decided that we wanted to play the Resident Evil Two remake, and. Uh, we bought it, and we were like, we'll just trade off the controller, uh, and any time one of us gets scared, we'll pass it to the other. We made That's it, a fun way to do it. We thought so. No. <laughs> <laughs> we made it to the police station, and then uh, there was a section where you have to kind of activate the first lever or something, so you have to go into a very dark, wet place and run around a corner and get a thing and run back, and that, that proved to be the one that broke us, and then we just stopped, and we got to the end of it. Yeah. When, we when, picked it back up. When you hear, what is his name, Mr. X or whoever he is, when you just hear those steps, I'm like, oh, no, I guess I got to do this again, and run around, <laughs> just hope I get away. Well, they're like actual nightmares. Like, a nightmare is bad enough, but you play a horror game, especially in VR, you're, it's like a real-time nightmare. Yeah. It's just designed to scare the hell out of you. Yeah, I think, like, Amnesia Dark Descent in VR would oh. probably give me a heart attack, like straight up. I think I'd probably die if I played it. I've never actually played the Amnesia games. That'd be, it looks like you highly recommend my, it. Uh, adrenaline. Yeah. Just an adrenaline dump after adrenaline dump. Yeah, they're, they're committed to um, making you as a player feel underpowered. And they do that basically by giving you absolutely no weapons, no way to fight back. It, it's all just stealth and... If you can't really do stealth in a way that makes you feel safe because if you stay in a stealthy place, a dark corner, they have a madness mechanic that kicks in. I like that. Yep. The so longer the longer you wait, you slowly you go, go mad. You go mad, exactly. So it's that's, a, that's a good way oof. to push you along. It works. It yeah. really does. And Amnesia will show you some horrible sights like along the way that you really don't want to look at. But yeah, it's... It's brutal. I always wonder if I was in a, you know, a, a slasher type scenario, if I wound up hiding in a spot that I thought was safe, because you, you always see them in there for like a few minutes and then they make a run for it when they're in the room facing the other way. I'm like, I might live there for a year. <laughs> oh, I'd go full Forrest Gump. I would just run. I'd run as fast and as far as I can. I would I, do the other Forrest Gump. I'd just live on the safe bench, <laughs> uh, which I have done in Labyrinthine. You know, it's like a multiplayer labyrinth game with monsters in it and, uh, yeah, you know, I was playing with three friends, and they have a glow stick mechanic where you can drop glow sticks so that your friends can find you and you can find them. I just stayed at the start making designs with the glow sticks, like figure eights, <laughs> and, uh, and they were kind enough to beat the level for me. And uh, and my friend Kat did the same thing, and we, um, yeah, you know, we just stayed there for 45 minutes while our poor friend Ryan found his way through the maze and Chris. Good luck, Ryan. You're doing great. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. We're headset. That, that, that was usually it. Yeah. Uh, I, before we, we moved on to discuss some of, uh, some of your works and your life, I did want to talk about the writer's strike, uh, at the top. I, it's very important to discuss, um, we're not a part of the writer's guild. I was wondering if you could explain to us and also some of our listeners, some of what's really important about the writer's strike. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the big one you're going to hear about is AI, cause that's kind of the hot topic right now, but I'm going to kind of skirt that one and talk a little bit more about the things that we're pushing for in terms of um, solving one of the bigger issues that has arisen since streaming, which is a dearth of showrunners. It used to be uh, you would work on a show, and no matter what level of achievement of writing you were at, you would be involved in the production of the show, in the filming of the show. You'd be on set if you wrote an episode. Often you'd be there in a, in a producerial uh, role where you're able to do things on the fly that would train you to be a showrunner, such as, you know, uh, take a look at dailies or make script changes on the fly, make sure that continuity is in order, that sort of thing. Kind of like uh, Vince Gilligan would do with Breaking Bad, not uh, kind of oversees the writing, not always directing, but kind of just moment to moment making decisions and Absolutely. leading it. Yeah. And, you know, you'd still have your Vin Vince Gilligan on set. And you'd still have your, your show's showrunner there. They would be guiding you and sort of teaching you as a writer for your episode how to do what it is that they do. Um, the problem is, is that streaming kind of got rid of that. Really? Um, yeah, because the streamers kind of made their own rules and how they were going to pay people or not pay people. 
So the latter that used to be like, you know, uh, staff writer to story editor to executive story editor to uh, co-producer, producer, all that kind of stuff and up and up and up. Yeah. Those titles used to have meaning in terms of experience on set. Now they don't at all because most of the writers, no matter what your level of achievement, your title have never been on set or if they have, have only been on set for about a day. It's easy for them to try and like push writers out of their minds because they're generally not on set. Absolutely. Yep. And they do that by having us write the entire show before they start filming, which is very different from how the networks used to work, especially when you think of, oh, pardon me, shows like Law and Order. They were writing that constantly, pretty much year round. Um, yeah. Or like soap operas are writing like the day of. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And all that has changed. Uh, the, a, the entire series or an entire season before oh, uh, you get into it? They oh, wanted, an, an entire season. I'm sorry if okay. I said series there. Uh, yeah, I'm a little weird. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's a big one. Um, others are compensation, the way that writers are compensated. It used to be that if you wrote an episode of television, um, you would get a back end on that. Basically, anytime it was watched, if it became a successful show, you get paid more money over time as people watch it more and more and more. You write Seinfeld season three, episode four. When that plays certain spots, you would receive um, a residual check. A residual check. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You got it. Uh, that's gone. Uh, so basically, you can write every episode on a hit show. You can have a, a shared author credit. Uh, and still, you got paid up front. You'll never see another dime. Yeah. And in the age of streaming, people have the ability to rewatch episodes and seasons over and over and over essentially on demand so that's that's crazy yeah i mean just like you think of a show like the office people when that's on whatever streaming platform they will watch that put it on and then it'll still be on in the morning and it's just a part of their life on repeat forever and with streaming uh once it gets out into like that platform it's very hard to like track uh viewership or like uh, how many people are actually watching the show and tracking those numbers and is it my understanding the residuals just don't happen once it makes it to a platform like that? Uh, yeah, so Netflix doesn't pay residuals to writers, for instance. Hmm. Um, pretty much nobody does, so I really shouldn't be picking on with, them. <laughs> with streaming, like, just that's the way it kind of happened when streaming picked up. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Those are the rules they set for themselves, being, quote-unquote, at the time, new media. Back before anyone knew what streaming was going to be and what it was going to become, which is essentially um, new cable on demand. Like, we didn't really expect it to be that. We expected it to be, I guess, more of a niche service at the time. When, you know, the WGA has been trying to catch up and essentially secure themselves the same kind of deals that they had back before all this, which enabled writers to have a career. If you do, say, you know, as a lucky, lucky writer, do one show a year, you work for six months and you're paid up front and then you're unemployed for six months and no back end, you can't make a living on that especially if you have a family it's just not gonna fly yeah um, and especially if you live in town if you live in los angeles it's a joke like you'll you'll be working any kind of secondary job you can get as fast as possible yeah and that makes of course you know going out and getting writing jobs even harder um so really if you're below the level of a creator or a showrunner you're pretty much yeah you know there's there's not much hope for you as a writer it becomes a gig economy really quickly yeah so the goal for the strike is to what, what, what is the, the end goal then for those issues? Yeah. So is there like a, a is there like a list that like we want absolutely these bare minimums to be met? Like and it's super reasonable. We just want to be recognized. Yeah, there's um, I was looking at this today. Let me pull it up. Actually, there's a you know, there's a list that the WGA puts up of what it is they've asked for. WGA and their negotiation committee has been really great and being as transparent uh, with their membership as possible to let us know what it is that they've been uh, asking for. And, you know, that breeds confidence in us because we know it isn't that they aren't just going to the mat to be like, you know, we want more stuff for our showrunners. It's like, no, they're, they're going to the mat for everybody. This is about making writing a, basically a profession. So, yeah, uh, if you head to the, like the WGA website, they have a WGA negotiations and the status will be of May 1st. That pretty much lays out everything that they've asked for. And I get like a little charty graph there. OK, but yeah, you know, most of what they're asking for is basically better compensation back end uh, guarantee that we won't be replaced by AI. Yeah. Um, you know, they aren't just going to essentially take all of our work, dump it into chat GPT mm -hmm. and say, write me something like uh, Flanagan would. 
and all of a sudden it spits out something and they're like, good enough. Um, same with just ideas for pitches. Um, you know, right now we, we pitch shows and then we sell those shows and you become a showrunner. That's, that's how it works. Um, now that's harder to do than I just made it sound, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But I could imagine there's, there's a lot to it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They would love nothing more than to be able to skip that part of the process. And by they, I mean, um, networks so they would much prefer to be able to use a program like chat gpt they just and, don't want to pay people what they like for their work exactly you yeah. know and they would just say to chat gpt hey um you know throw me an idea that has uh, teenage protagonists magical powers make a stranger things universe. rip off exactly make it like stranger things only slightly different and it would spit out six nonsense sentences at them you know what they do they would take that they would call it their ip and then they would hire writers to work on it but none of those writers would be in any positions of creative control. It and would be they'd entirely, get, there'd be no showrunner. It'd be a, an AI. It'd like, be like <laughs> a small gig work, like take this bare bones BS that we just had a computer print out for us and just, and even then they'd probably like just tweak some of it. It'd be essentially like, uh, it sped out some sentence where it's like farm boy saves the universe. And they're like, we just wrote Star Wars. Yeah. That sounds like a good video game, though. Farm Boy Saves the Universe. I would play Farm Boy. I, I play it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a classic plot line, like you said. It's also the, what is it, the Bulgarian, same plot. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah you know, it, it. it's stuff like that where I'm like, they would just cut out the human element and, you know, go from there. And if it's their IP and they own it. And, yeah, you know, that that's different when they bring on somebody and they already own the largest piece of the idea itself. That really irks me because <laughs> yeah. when you're writing, I mean, it is the human that puts the emotion into it and crafts the story. That's kind of, I think, what kind of draws us all together when we hit a phenomenon show like Game of Thrones was, Stranger Things, those sort of things. Like, there's a human element to it that we all kind of bond over and removing that entirely and having AI spit you a, yeah. a pitch real quick so that you can throw a show out. It just seems so soulless. AI doesn't have trauma. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing. It doesn't have experience, but well, uh, that's, that's a horrible situation. Um, <laughs> and we're, I mean, a hundred percent with the, the writer's guild and you're in a unique position cause you're also in the actor's guild, right? Yeah, I'm SAG, uh, which is, has been tricky. I, um, yeah, you know, if uh, SAG has a no um, strike clause, basically that means that if you are cast as a SAG actor in a production, that you have to continue working on it, even if you have solidarity with the other striking union. So what SAG is doing now is they've called for, and this hasn't happened in a while, strike authorization, which is great. Uh, so recently I, I voted my yes vote for the SAG strike as well. It's my second <laughs> strike vote on one of my guilds in the same year and um yeah so sag is going to have a, a final tally on that by june 30th which will be do they have enough uh for the authorization and then they'll give that authorization to their negotiating committee so that when their negotiating committee goes into the amptp i'm probably screwing up that acronym i apologize and, um i forgive you <laughs> yeah uh they they're gonna head in there and basically be able to say if you don't deal fairly with us uh, the actors will also go on strike. Good. A united front would be great. That seems to be the interesting thing about the strike uh, is that uh, the guilds are really unified. And I think often um, I was reading an article about uh, how these negotiations sometimes go with the, um, the networks kind of uh, doing a divide and conquer thing with the, with SAG and the Directors Guild and the Writers Guild. Yeah. Where they'll essentially tell one guild like the Writers Guild, you know, hey, we're we're going to put off the negotiations with you. You, you. We'll figure it out after the DGA, which is what they're doing now. And the idea is once they finish negotiating with the DGA, they come back to the writers and say, yep, we made our deal with the directors. And sadly, that's all we got. So here's what we have left for you. And this time it doesn't look like that's going to be the case because the DGA seems to be in solidarity with us. So I think this time it, it's going to be a different story. I think, you know, Tom Hanks pointed it out that the industry is at a crossroads. And that everybody knows it. <laughs> we all see it. It's, it's the Wild West once again with all these new ways to create content. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, actors are being digitized. And they're not being as threatened now. But I guarantee 10, 20 years from now when it's easier to do that with all this, like, weird art that they can do, actors are going to be getting threatened out of roles, too, with computers. So, I mean, if you yeah. give, give them an inch, they're going to take a mile on any of this. So Absolutely. I met a stunt woman who'd been digitized for a series of, uh, I think it was games. Uh, and she was telling me that that was maybe five, six years ago, something like that. Um, 
and since then she has learned that that digitized skeleton and the the movements that she brought to them are essentially there so they don't need her anymore weird feelings about that <laughs> no it's bad yeah. no yeah like no it makes me they, they own her skeleton in the computer. and her movements and you know they can now make her body do whatever they want it to do i think it was donnie so, yeah. yen for the second matrix film he was going to be in it but he said you're not digitizing me i'm going to be there and do all my stunts if you try and make a digital version of me i'm out mm. and they said they were and he's like i'm out fair yeah and yeah. that would have been the same situation uh well uh let's talk a little bit about uh your 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 life and career Jamie, so I am a big fan. Oh, S thanks. Spoiler warning. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, big fan of horror, big fan of all of the shows that you have worked on. But let's uh, kind of start at the beginning. I mean, you, you grew up, you were born in Manhattan, right? Uh, sort of. I was born on Governor's Island, which is a little three-mile Coast Guard island. A little crockpot or yeah, something? Exactly. Yeah, very <laughs> much so. Yeah. Very much so. So right off Manhattan, there is an island uh, to which there are no bridges and no roads. Uh, you can only get there by ferry boat. It used to be a Coast Guard island. Then it got sold to the state of New York, I think for a dollar because the pipes underneath it were going bad. I and wish the, I was there. I would have bought it. You can go there now. It's a yeah. now it's a it's sort of a tourist attraction. It's very artsy. They've got like a like a hammock garden or something. You can like Coachella style get a tent and just camp out there. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I was born, and. Uh, then moved to Maryland, then moved back there, then back to Maryland, kind of like a, you know, uh, military family ping pong ball. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, that was uh, that was that was the early days. Um, then, yeah, you know, um, when I went to college, I was a theater major and tried to be an actor out of that and ended up doing Do the same did, thing. You didn't try to be an actor. You were an actor. You acted in oh. a lot of stuff back hey, thanks. then. You, like Columbinus, I was reading about. That, oh, was, wow. that seemed like it was a pretty big success. Yeah, uh, Columbinus was great. We made it uh, all the way from uh, Roundhouse and Silver Spring, which was the world premiere, to Juneau, Alaska, Perseverance Theater out there, and then finally to um, New York Theater Workshop, which was pretty cool. I would have I would have checked it out, but that's one of those things that have the great things about uh, theater work is you got to be there, you know? Yeah, it's it's crazy. You know, it's ethereal that way. And that's one thing I love about theater. But that's also on the split side. It's it's one thing I love about film and television is that I can return to these things that meant so much to me. And I can do that almost any time I want, with the exception of the things that, you know, are only digital releases and then get evaporated. That hasn't happened to anything I've worked on yet, but it is also a concern. <laughs> it's a scary thing. I know that's happened with a lot of video games where they were online only and that experience is gone. Yep. Poof. If you look at Destiny 2, there's parts of that game you'll never see if you start playing it now. I played yeah. tons of Destiny 1 and like they took Dinklage out. Where's Dinklebot? They yeah, took, I know. They took yeah. him out and they're like, he was kind of a flat performance. I'm like, he was a robot. Let him be a robot. I don't care. It was a bad performance, but it was an endearing one. But it was uh, his performance. That <laughs> wizard is from the moon. I mean, it was, that, I, I fell over when I first heard that. It was great. Uh, yeah, I like Destiny quite a bit. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, you did a lot of acting. You, you worked on Colin Bison and you moved to New York. And I did want to talk to you about your time in New York a little bit because we're both bartenders. I used to be a bartender until recently. You're a bartender. Currently. How long did you work in the service industry? Uh, the full two years that I was there. Okay. Um, I never worked in a show again uh, in that space in New York. Okay. I never auditioned again after that. I, well, I did that one show, and then I moved in with a couple of pals out there, you know, about four or five of us living in a three-bedroom. We built fake walls. $10,000. Yeah, exactly. The guy who, who lived in, we had a little, you know, there's a basement on there, and we, we laid a, a plank of wood on the staircase leading to the basement, put a twin bed on it, walled it off. That was the room. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, he paid like 600 bucks, and he'd been there before I was like he he was there for the when that was built I say we built it I wasn't there for that but the same name had been on the lease for about 10 years um which is kind of crazy yeah uh, you know to keep the rent control down I guess and I understand yeah. yeah you get grandfathered in on those you know prices do you want to keep it yeah and so you know I I did what you do which is I I walked around you know and I beat the pavement and I went into Anyone who looked like they were hiring, um, I filled out applications and just lied through my teeth about <laughs> places that I worked or bartended or was a server at uh, in places that did not exist because they want New York work experience specifically. And I had just moved to New York. Yeah. And I'd never been anything besides a host before, but okay. I was like, I don't want to do that again. I want to be a, want to be a server or a bartender. 
I ended up talking my way into a, a couple of gigs and they were all disasters. I was horrible. I was, <laughs> I was, oh man, uh, I was a decent bar back, but shh, ask me for anything more than an and drink. And I, I just, I pity anyone that I served for those two years. <laughs> they, they were drinking just, you know, the equivalent of jazz cocktails. I was just, you know, making it up on the spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's in this one? I don't know. I, I'm thankful I'm just a beer tender. I don't got to make cocktails. It's hard to mess up draft beer. Nice. Yeah. It's real difficult. That's what I was doing as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I worked in craft breweries for like eight years, and when someone orders a beer, it's hard for me to mess it up. Yep. Uh, yeah. I've seen people mess them up, but yeah, if, if it's a cocktail, my wife has graded them, but I am, I'm, I'll just dazzle you with conversation, but don't ask me to know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I had the misfortune of working mostly fine dining, so you dress in all black. Uh, one was called Seven Square. I think it's now a Serafina's. The other one was called Bar Stuzzacchini. I think it closed during the... Um, the pandemic, but hmm. you know, I tried to go back to Bar Street Zucchini and to and to Seven Square again to Seven Square only to find the Serafinas uh, right across from. Uh, I think Chicago used to play across from it. I don't know if it still does now. Uh, over in Times Square, and then Bar Street Zucchini is a little further downtown. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's crazy. It's just strange to see those places reimagined. Um, Seven Square had been part of the Time Hotel, so I'd been kind of attached to it that way, and. You would spend your time between Seven Square, that kind of upscale restaurant downstairs, yeah. and then, you know, like, uh, you take a short elevator ride up in the glass elevator, and then you're at the Time Hotel Lounge, you know? And I kind of bounce between those two places, and you do a lot of promoter parties in the upstairs ones, and those were great nights, because it was just, like, Grey Goose and, like, Cranberry or just Hennessy, like, that was most of what I served, yeah. and then, you know, you're, you're getting the... The security guys hopped up on Red Bull, which is a bit dangerous, but that's the other part of the job. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't. So you didn't it. you didn't love the service industry? No, but I'm glad that I did it. Um, it you know it taught me a lot about <laughs> hard work, especially yeah. in New York when you're open until four in the morning. That sounds rough. Yeah, that those hours are brutal. You yeah, know? Um, they really are. You you age quickly, and you see a lot of things that make you age quickly. You get tired. That's a lot. Those were late nights. Uh, yeah. You moved into uh, being an echocardiographer then. Oh yeah, yeah. I did that for a while. So I was thirty years old, and I, by then I'd already gone back to DC and, and acted again for a while, whilst doing a bunch of other things like adjunct teaching and. Oh man, what else did I try? I forget a ton of things. Uh, if you just throw everything at the board, something will stick, right? That was the hope. You know, I had a theater degree, so you know, I think anyone out there with an arts degree will will agree with this. It's almost impossible to find uh, a job that will sustain you in the arts. So yeah, you know, I I went back to school. I did prerequisites for medical, not knowing what I wanted to do. I thought maybe PA. That's a safe thing to do, though. Like just do prereqs, and you can kind of make more of a decision along yeah. the way. Uh, originally, I went in for med lab tech and then learned that I don't like poking other people with needles. Oh, man, I couldn't do that. No I way. I couldn't either. And then, yeah, you know, I, uh, my mother was an office manager, and I asked her who the happiest person in her office was. She said, it, it's our echo tech. And I was like, oh, cool. So I became an echocardiographer, and I learned that, unfortunately, uh, the person that I had been introduced to, Emily, is just a very happy person in general. <laughs> and it didn't actually apply to the job. Um, I did that for six years, um, and I was in a community hospital for a while yeah. and then private practice and uh, again i aged a lot in those years that's that's a that's a tough job because what you 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 do heart scans and you yeah. that's what it is right mm -hmm. yeah. so basically you're you get your 40 year olds who are just there for a tune-up but most of the time you're dealing with people who are you know um in some stage of dying um hmm. Which, you know, I guess we all are in, in the greater sense, but, you know, these people are just a little closer than the rest of us at the finish line. And unfortunately, with the way that these jobs work, these technician jobs, is that you don't get any closure. Uh, because you just one day the patient stops coming to see you for their scheduled whatever, but you're not allowed to look up if they've died, what's happened to them, anything like that. So it's it's... A very painful and soulless job if you don't get to know your patients, and then it's a very painful and soulless job if you do get to know them because you never have closure. And yeah, that sounds rough. I'm probably in, it's informed some of the work you've written on, I imagine. I mean, a lot of it deals with death. So yeah, you know, I got a compliment once from my sister in law, um, which was, you know, it's pretty neat. <laughs> but um, I remember we were talking about stuff and I was telling her that, yeah, you know, I hadn't been exposed too much to death. And, and technically that's true because I was never around these people when they died. They, they're just an absence. I never was there for the 
that part of it. Um, and uh, she says, oh, but you write about it beautifully. And I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, so that, that was an interesting moment where I realized apparently, even though I don't know many people who have uh, died that I have been around to witness that or to really be a part of it, um, I've been just outside the door for more deaths than I can count. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, just around the corner. Um, Having a, a gentle uh, way to address that topic is very important and difficult. Uh, I remember when my mom passed, my landlord said to me, like, don't let anyone tell you how to grieve. And I was like, the best advice I ever had, because I'm like, I have permission to feel how I want and do this the way I want, which, yeah, I don't know, you can't teach that kind of stuff. That is just uh, part of who you are. And through experience, you kind of learn some of those feelings. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's great advice. Yeah, I really like that one. Uh, and I know you're not listening, Doreen, but her dog's getting put down today. And I'm oh. sad I couldn't be there to be there for her. Um, I'm sorry as well. Uh, I, I have had a similar situation, but uh, yeah, how old? Um, he was an old man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, do- the dog was fairly fairly old, but Buddy was a good boy. Uh, mm-hmm. Mad love to you, Buddy. I'm so sorry to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you you did some acting though uh, around that time because uh, you were in an episode of House of Cards. Was that was that in DC? <laughs> uh, that was in Baltimore. That was in Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was like the first time I ever appeared on screen in anything uh, aside from Absentia. And um, mm-hmm. anyway, and Absentia was after House of Cards. Yeah, Absentia was a fun role. It seemed like. Yeah, yeah, Absentia was great. Yeah, yeah that, that was that was like you know back when we just felt like a scrappy group of people making making whatever we wanted. You know? Yeah, and. Uh, Changed a bit since then. <laughs> on the fly, on the cheap. What do we got? Look at this tunnel. That'll work. Yep. That pretty much. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Um, my brother had, you know, called me up and he's like, I'm, you know, making something for my friends' reels. My acting friends <laughs> want to make, want to make them something for their reels. And here's what we got. You know, we got, we know what wants to be horror. We have my apartment and we have this, the tunnel, um, as you know, beside it. I was like, oh, man, yeah, uh, off the cuff, you do Billy Goat's Gruff. That's as far as I ever got into advising that project. He wrote the script on his own and, you know, broke it on his own, did all that. Uh, but, yeah, that was my small contribution was, you know, doing urban, contemporary Billy Goat's Gruff. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so House of Cards, you were there for uh, just for one episode? Was that like a couple yeah, days or like episode. a week or so? Uh, no, that was, a, that was just a day. A I day. was a day player. Okay. Uh, I came in and... Uh, I had half of a line. It got cut off with an M dash, and it's in app three. I think you can still go see it. In the I first saw it on your so. reel. Yeah, that's it. That's the entirety of my performance in that, in that episode. Nailed it though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yep. Uh, and basically, yeah, I went in, and it was such a, a throwaway line and a throwaway part that they didn't they didn't have a seat for me at the table to say it originally. Um, and when I kind of blurted out the line, they all looked at me surprised, and then looked at the <laughs> scripts, and they're like, "Get this kid a chair. <laughs> <laughs> this guy needs a chair." Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was fun. Uh, I got paid more for that than I did for most shows that I've ever been in. Um, so, a large amount of your career, of your professional uh, filmography, your acting, your writing, is with your brother Mike yeah. Flanagan. Um, I'm just curious, what was what were you guys like as kids? I mean, were you were you out there writing stories and clashing your you know your toys together? I imagine that's kind of what it was. Yeah, you know, Mike was always the more creative engine of us in that. I, I just kind of, you know, went along to get along. Um, I remember once he he plays he plays keyboard. He's self taught, and um, he wanted to do this thing at this library and, and basically play songs from Little Mermaid. And he played Under the Sea, and I was Sebastian the Dancing Crab. And danced around to that. Um, <laughs> I like that. Yep, we made a remake of The Untouchables. Okay. Um, and yep, you know, there were a bunch of us in that one, but I was like, had to have been in maybe third grade and was running around <laughs> with a little fedora and I'd, I think I'd sprained my leg or something. I had a cast on and yeah, we just cre- recreated scenes from, from the untouchables. And then for the explosions, we just cut in the actual movie. <laughs> <laughs> just like a jump in production value out of nowhere. <laughs> out of nowhere. Uh, we made an, like a very tiny horror movie in which I was the protagonist called Beyond Dead. <laughs> which was uh, 
Yeah, uh, basically about a you know killer stalking a home. It's very hush like now that I think about it in hindsight. Yeah, uh, killer stalking a home, and the big special effect we had for that was we took a gardening glove and filled it with leaves so we could stab it through the hand. Yeah, and I think that would be the first Mike Flanagan hand injury that I can think of on film, and there've been so many since. Yeah, Gerald's game has scarred me. Yeah, yeah it's oof. a big one, you know. And then Roy Cochran ripping off his fingernails and. Oculus. And yeah, there's a lot of hand problems. In a lot of that, that, that's something that everyone's got strong feelings of is about their hands, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah. For like sure. In Black Swan, when she like pulls the skin. Oh, my yeah. God. I still have nightmares about just that mm. one little shot. There's a horrifying one in the new John Wick film. Love that. Yeah. I did really like the new John Wick film. It's the best one since the, the best one since the first movie. I thought the second and third were fine. They got I didn't like the way they were shot as much kind of too much lighting and craziness. This one, though, three hours of action that I didn't get bored at. And it managed to, like, balance, like, silly cartoony. Like, they have that one character, I think his name was Killa, that plays the poker game. And I'm like, he is, he's pushing the limits of, like, graphic novel fun. Yeah. But when he does that roundhouse kick, I'm like, I don't care, I'm in. Yeah. I'll, I'll bite. Just give me more nun- nunchucks. Just give me the nunchucks yeah. is yeah, all I want. Give me more. I've never seen anyone do, like, two-handed single nunchuck and just, like, uppercut someone. Yeah, fun film. <laughs> Call that Babe Ruth in it. I I really loved the staircase sequence. Just watching um, Keanu Reeves fight his way up. I forget how many flights of stairs is that? It's like, like I forget, 212 steps or something. Yeah, and then fall all the way back down. It, it was like a Buster <laughs> Keaton moment. It's like, like a metaphor. <laughs> It was great. Yeah. Uh, I was dying. I was like, this, <laughs> this is the funniest thing I've seen all, all year. Yeah, just a brutal, brutal movie. Um, so, yeah, you kind of then, you still weren't doing a lot of writing, but you were jumping in and out of some acting roles, mostly, you know, jumping on to some of your brother's work. Like, you were in Oculus. You made a, an appearance in Gerald's Game. Yeah, yeah, Court Clerk, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hill House is the first thing I remember seeing you in. Yeah, I got to have a monologue in that one. That was fun. Um, yeah, Mike, um, you know, after absentia, um, when Mike was just kind of kicking off, especially with Oculus, he, you know, he, it was his first time working with Trevor and, um, Macy, his producing partner. And I, I, you know, Mike was still trying to prove himself, but he still wanted to bring in all of his old guard. And if you look around, there's a lot of, a lot of really cool folks back from, uh, Baltimore, Maryland in, in those early films, like, uh, in Oculus, uh, Scott Graham, the original protagonist of the 30-minute Oculus that was the short that it's based on, is in it for a little while. He plays a, uh, oh, um, somebody cleaning the mirror uh, in the antiques uh, auction house. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Dave Levine, who was in Absentia, popped in next to me in Oculus as the other ghost. We called it Skinny Ghost, Fat Ghost, just the <laughs> two of us. Um yeah, Mike was really good about that. I'd watch and, a comedy series called Skinny Goat Fat Ghost. Yeah, you know, we, there's a spinoff there. Yeah. That, you know, never got explored, unfortunately. But, you know, yeah, maybe a dark comedy. We can bring it back. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, Mike just would consistently reach out to me while I was, you know, jumping between jobs and sort of not knowing what I was doing. It was very, very awesome of him and very big brotherly. Um, and, yeah, you know, I'd, I had been writing short stories um, because I'd been taking a creative writing class along with the prerequisites during the medical stuff to keep sane. And uh, there was a, a prompt they gave us, which was, you know, take a classic monster or monster story and reimagine somebody in it, um, a la Wicked or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. So take a side character and make them the focus. And I wrote something called um, Brides, which is about the Brides Dracula, really short, like one pager. Um, and then later on, I just really liked those characters and exploring what that was. And uh, in between patients, I ended up writing a script, uh, which uh, at the time I called Brides, later became Muse. And uh, between that and adapting uh, a favorite novel of mine, which I didn't have the rights to, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. <laughs> I, um, I sent both of those scripts to Mike and Trevor and essentially asked them if they'd be willing to let me into a writer's room. And those two scripts got me in on merit uh, and nepotism, and off I went. And uh, You had to prove yourself, though. I mean, if you you had to send those scripts in, it's nice that you had someone's ear, but it sounds like you also had to do in the the work, so. Yeah, you know, and it's a double-edged sword. I'm not going to complain too much about it because I've had more opportunity and more privilege than I deserve. Um, But, yeah, you know, it... um, when you're in those rooms and you have the same last name as the showrunner, but you aren't on that level, 
it does put a, a target on your back sometimes for some people. And so you kind of have to ride that out. Um, but again, that, that doesn't outweigh the privilege. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's fun making movies. It's fun being there and your fingerprints are all over, uh, the work you've done. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Yeah. I, I like to think so for sure. Uh, when you, when you hear those words come through when you're watching a show, that's got to be a pretty cool feeling. It is. And my favorite, uh, hands down, is Midnight Mass, um, which I know is Mike's favorite as well at, at present. Um, though I think Usher might be giving it a run for its money uh, for him. <laughs> He's been talking a lot and very excitedly about it. I haven't, mm. seen, haven't seen the episodes of Usher yet, but I'm very excited. Um, I know he is too. Uh, but yeah, Midnight Mass um, is so immediate to um to the uh the childhood that we shared and uh, how we were raised and the family members in our lives and you know uh mike's had his struggles with alcohol so have I. I got my first dui the first time i lived in los angeles and then you know struggled with alcohol pretty much ever since um it's um there's a lot in that show that was extremely cathartic to write but even more cathartic was hearing it filtered through exceptional actors who basically brought those words to life and made them sing Hamish Linklater. Oh my gosh, I, man, I, yeah. I, I've never been just so blown away by an actor cause I hadn't seen him before. And I said, who is this? Yeah. Do you, the way that you, you can feel him thinking mm -hmm. the, through the words and like just laying out the tracks in front of his railroad, that's just flooring like forward. Oh, it's almost hypnotic when he's on. Cause it's like, you don't want to blink. Like his delivery of the lines, I, you just, yeah. it feels like it comes from a different place. If we had a priest like that in Catholic school, I would have been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, that's kind of what we were doing. We had a nice priest when we were kiddos named Father Stack. He was just a genuinely fun person to be around and just a nice accepting guy. And um, I think a lot of how we perceived him went into um, Father Paul and... And basically, when I, I I had a shot at a couple of the monologues and a lot of what I wrote is still in there. I was I was writing a priest I would have loved to have had. I was writing the person that I wish had been a spiritual leader. You know, both of us went to Catholic school, uh, grade school and high school, and then both of us ended up on my worst days. I'm agnostic. On my best days, I'm an atheist. I know Mike's an atheist. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it does something to you. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I feel like I trailed off there for a sec. I was enjoying every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, before we get into the big three that are already out, I did want to just mention a couple other things. Uh, first, I really enjoyed Equinox on Paperless Pulp. I thought that was a <laughs> fantastic, fun little uh, podcast episode. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was some of the later later acting work I did for fun with just pe theater people who were doing something new. They're like, we're doing a podcast. Do you want to do a voice? And I was like, sure. Yeah, that seemed like a fun little project. And I liked the, the story and getting stuck time traveling to prevent the, the wrong thing from happening. Yeah, yeah, those are always good stories. And Apocalypse Airbnb was very fun too. <laughs> Finding love in an apocalypse is a cute prospect. <laughs> apocalypse Airbnb was is the probably the most farcical thing I've ever done, which is really <laughs> not my mo. I tend to, when I'm on stage, underplay everything. So the director had to drag this vocal performance out of me that was very sort of loud and pushed and precise, but that worked for the comedy of it, I guess. You got to um, keep your place clean. You got to keep it organized. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it makes you loud, I think. Uh, I like The Shining a lot. Oh, uh, boy. here we go. So like, I'm like just inked up with Kubrick all over my arm here. Oh, wow. Look at that. So Dr. Sleep, man, that's a, that's a tough thing. And it like, I was, I'm like, I don't know about this guys. I don't know if we need a sequel to one of my favorite films of all time. And then I saw, saw Mike was doing it. I'm like, I, I really trust him. I don't know if I want this. And then, of course, uh, it wasn't what I expected, and it was fantastic. And, yeah, you got to be a member of The Knot. That must have been a fun, fun it, couple it days. It was, yeah. Being a member of The Knot was a blast. Um, and I love what Mike did with that one. You know, the, He basically gave, gave Dr. Sleep the ending that The Shining has in the book. He gave King back his ending. To try and keep... Uh, yep. King fans and Kubrick fans happy at the same time because those camps were against each other for a long time. Very much so. Yeah. And, you know, bringing back the Overlook was really um, 
from what I've been told, I can't talk about this firsthand. Like I was in the room for these decisions. I was sure. not. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, from what I've been told, like bringing back the overlook was very sort of controversial and difficult to, difficult to sell. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Mike managed to sell it to King by describing the bar scene and, you know, that idea of sort of generational trauma and uh, alcoholism and recovery. And apparently that's what, that's what sold it. That's what got it done. Um, and that scene remains one of my favorite pieces of Mike's work. Yeah. I can't believe that they stuck the landing on that movie. I, I wanted to be upset the whole time and I was enjoying it. And it was hard for me to admit that for a while. <laughs> yeah. I'm very unapologetically. I mean, my whole right arm is dedicated to my homie Stanley. So I'm a pretty big fan. Weather Tokyo Fresh Podcast. I'm David. I'm Jordan. We're a comedy lifestyle podcast diving into the weird and interesting side of Japan. We often share stories about our lives in Japan, you know, and how you can avoid making the same mistakes. So if you want to take advice from two idiots who have been living here far too long, check out the Tokyo Fresh Podcast. Only on the Tokyo Beat Network. Today's show is brought to you by Epos Gaming Audio. With a comprehensive lineup of both wired and wireless headsets, gaming amplifiers, microphones, and webcams, Epos has everything you need to experience the power of audio. Like their H6 Pro lineup, which features two versions, an open or closed headset. The closed headset allows you to tap into exceptionally detailed audio and seals out ambient noise while the open version delivers natural high fidelity audio with an incredible soundstage. Both headsets include a magnetic detachable microphone and a sleek design that has no wild RGB configurations, just good design. Listeners can save 15% by visiting www.eposaudio.com slash gaming, entering code EPOSFRIEND15 at checkout. That is EPOSFRIEND15 at checkout. So now that we've mentioned a lot of those other things, I'd like to talk about some of the big ones. Like uh, Bly Manor was the first one that you kind of moved into working with uh, Mike and his producing partners. I forget you, Tre Trevor Macy? Uh, Trevor Macy over at Intrepid, yeah. Uh, that was the first one I wrote on. I was a staff writer. Uh, it's the lowest totem, you know, where you start in the, the ladder. And we had some really lovely writers on there. What what uh, what does a staff writer like? How does... What does the contribution look like? Is it uh, sitting around in a room? Is it like, here's episodes, everyone just vibe a little bit? Basically, yeah, how it worked with that one, uh, because we didn't have the whole season mapped out when we first started, um, was that all of us met together in the room. Didn't, didn't really matter what your title was as long as you were one of the writers. Um, you meet at a big old table. You come every day, and all of you kind of rank regardless. Just start pitching ideas and building episodes together. So it's essentially just like an open blue sky. Yeah. yeah, like and that's No it. ideas too wild, no ideas too crazy. Let's see what you got sort of thing. Absolutely. And blue sky is a word we throw around a lot. It's um, one of my favorite terms. Yep. So for that one, we all went home and we're each assigned a Henry James story. Okay. And then we came in and we kind of gave a report on, you know, what it was, what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it, how we thought it might fit in with the pilot, which did exist. And, you know, kind of the trajectory of the show, we all fell in love with the... Um, the romance of certain old clothes, which ended up being... Um, oh, it's such a fun, haunting story. Yeah, we ended up doing that one pretty much one-to-one. -one. I mean, that is the short story, and we just stuck it in the show as our keystone. We're like, all right, so our haunting is going to be based entirely on this one Henry James story that we'll keep kind of under the radar until we just do it. And when that episode happens, uh, it just blows me away. I'm like, it's so bold to just like, all right, we left you at a cliffhanger. Now everyone just wait a sec. Yeah, you know, we had a whole day of what's it like in the trunk. You know, what does that look like? How does that manifest? Yeah. Um, you know, how, walking. What is the life Waiting. of a ghost? Well, I mean, oh, God. The, what is the life of a ghost is the you know, worst, <laughs> you know, way to describe that. But, yeah, it, we talked about that constantly. Ghost rules, how they function, um, trying to make sense of a thing that can't be made sense of. And then, you know, trying to throw these rules in there that hopefully make everything that we do within there feel earned. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's tricky. <laughs> the, the most heartbreaking aspect of Bly Manor is 
the deterioration of someone's personality and their being. Uh, they fight so hard to hold on to those few moments. And you see Hannah in that episode just keep coming back to that one moment when she's sitting there with Rahul's character. I forget his name. Um, Owen. Owen. Yeah. Owen, yeah. yeah. And gosh, that must have been a very interesting uh, episode to write because you have to like almost roadmap where these things are and they, the way that they keep coming back and just shooting, keeping the actors like lined up. Uh, did, was that, a, I mean, I imagine that was been a pretty tricky yeah, scenario. Yeah, so we broke that episode as a room and then Mike went back in on that one and did some pretty heavy rewrites uh, basically to map it out and make it make sense. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the timelines especially because we were, we were juggling, you know, quite a few in that show. Um, yeah, we, we had to keep everything straight, try to keep our years straight. And uh, it gets timelines get really tricky really quick, especially in a writer's room. Even if you have it written down on the board, it's just it's easy to forget where you are. And that's sort of something we leaned into for Hannah. It's easy to forget where you are hmm. um, <laughs> and just go with whatever is presented to you in the immediate moment. Um, yeah. When I was in college, I did a lot of script soup work. And so continuity was something that I had to keep track of, especially between the different takes and I would keep notes and I would have a fat stack of notes after, you know, one day of shooting for a couple hours for a five minute project. And I can only imagine an episode like that. You got to have entire textbooks just trying to keep it straight. Uh, yeah, I'd imagine I wasn't on set for when they filmed that app. But yeah, uh, continuity <laughs> must have been a bear. Yeah, that's never fun work. Mm -hmm. The actors just across the board are just knocking it out of the park. And, you know, for... Uh, Hannah's uh, character, Tania Miller, the mm -hmm. one who plays her, to know, like, all right, where's my character at uh, currently while I'm reliving the same moment a thousand times? When you are writing for Bly Manor, did you know, um, all right, we have uh, Oliver Jackson Cohen, we have Victoria Pendretti. Did you know those actors' faces and what they would sound like, kind of? Yeah, uh, uh, different ones at different times. We knew from the beginning that we had Oliver and that we had Victoria coming back. Um, yeah. So we were writing, we were writing for their voices with their characters early on, um, and then you know more casting choices came in as things went, and uh, you know that was the first thing that uh, Rahul had worked on with Intrepid. So we we didn't know who we were writing for really, unless we unless he were someone who was a big fan of iZombie. Like it, it uh, he was a new one that I don't think we actually knew who was cast as Owen until very late in the process. Yeah. Um, and I remember watching um, watching auditions for Jamie, um, which was lovely. They, um, you know, I wrote up two, and um, they they used basically the two big Jamie scenes in there, which I adore. Which are um, the sort of kindness between strangers scene, where Danny has a panic attack and is soothed yeah. by Jamie. That's pro possibly one of the pieces of writing that I am most proud of. Yeah, because I believe wholeheartedly that um, those are the most interesting moments in, in shows, are kindness between strangers. Maybe mm -hmm. not the most, but very interesting moments. I don't want to get hyperbolic. Um, but, sure. um, yeah, uh, I really like that scene. There's a delicacy to it. Um, it I, I love the, the romances that are written into these as well. I mean, you guys, I, I, I haven't read the original Henry James Turn of the Screw, but I imagine... Danny, the gardener that Danny falls in love with is probably more like traditional male-female romance, right? Oh, so about that. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't fall in love with a gardener. Uh, okay. And she ends up killing one of the kids. And, oh, um, I haven't read that book. Yes. I, I just <laughs> bought it, and it's not too big, so I was going to check it out. But Spoiler for Turn of the Screw. It's a lot darker than Blind Matter. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, man. And it's more about um, uh, subjectivity and mania almost uh you you get a person so convinced that there is this haunting taking place that they cause harm to another character and at the end you're left in an in an ambiguous place yeah as to whether or not the haunting was real and okay. this was justified or if this uh governess just killed a child for no reason because of their own mania yeah um, and that's you know the genius of turn of the screw we couldn't really replicate that uh, so unfortunately, Cause yeah, I mean, that's the, the nature of the beast. If there's something on screen, that's kind of like written in stone a little bit. Yep. There's already a film adaptation of it that does it beautifully called The Innocence. Okay. Um, very much worth a watch. And 
we took the the song from that the, the soundtrack is a hummed song uh, beneath the weeping willows i think it's called and we we took that and kind of made it a very central part of our show as homage but we didn't want to just recreate what was already a grand success because we knew we'd le- never live up to that so we went off and did our own thing as is usually our way it's great when uh, a lot of these projects, I know like Christopher Pike, you'll wind up referencing a lot of stories. It's great if you go to a, a well-known author and you're like, these these are all really great and we can implement a lot of this. And it's kind of an overarching homage to uh, a lot of the things you love. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we love that about adaptation in general is being able to tip our hats to who we're adapting. Um, and then at the same time, we, we really like to sort of make those things our own. I think when someone reads a book and really loves it in their head, they've already cast it differently than the author ever did. They're already assigning different assumptions of emotion to characters than maybe the author did. You make it yours, in essence, by reading it. You know, you picture scenes differently. You're taking part in it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we, we do something a little bit more extreme when we chop it up, throw it in the air and see what lands, but mm. it's the same principle. You mentioned music and there's one thing I did want to ask about because there is a recurring, uh, song that happens in a lot of um mike's work uh go tomorrow by the newton brothers that lovely piano like haunting piece is uh, is there a certain context or history to that song or that's just like the haunting song because that's in also ouija the the prequel ouija movie that he did beginnings i think it's called oh uh, origin of evil origin of evil <laughs> uh, i remember watching successful that successful film on rotten tomatoes his highest rated film and his highest rated work Interesting. is ouija origin of evil it's fantastic <laughs> it's i remember great, yeah. i remember watching it and be like this is the second one <laughs> what's going on here oh man no it's it's great you know that was one of those ones where you know Mike was handed a franchise that, you know, had, had you know, didn't have the, the greatest reputation. And um, the level of expectation, I think, from the studio was so, you know, the bar was low enough that they just didn't care what Mike did. Just so he go got away it. with murder and made something pretty great. <laughs> uh, but but uh, the song, is there like a certain history to that song or is it just a song that... Um not that I know of, but okay. that would be a Mike question for sure. I wasn't there, sure if you might have a perspective. very well could be, but he never, if there was, he never shared it with me. I know he loves the Newton Brothers to pieces, and, and they are extremely talented. Um, so I imagine that anything he does, you'll, you'll hear their, their stamp on it. Well, uh, I guess we can talk about the Midnight Mass in the room. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, I almost have... I almost wanted to like just call you guys up and yell at you. I said, how did you follow my life as a child? How did you know about this stuff? (laughs) Not so much the vampires, but to to have a show that comes out uh, about small town Catholicism starring my parents. uh, Yeah. And and (laughs) starring my parents. Because those Flynn parents (laughs) are when uh, Henry Thomas is sitting there as Warren Flynn. And he's at the dinner table and he's just not saying anything. And they're like talking back and forth, making jokes. He's like, nope, that one wasn't funny. And he's yeah. like, I, I lose it every time. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. He's, a, he's, like, a, he's Ed in that. Ed uh, Flynn. Yeah. Ed Flynn. Uh, but yeah, no, for sure. Like yeah. I, he plays a very good repressed uh, Catholic dad. and Not um, great at hugs. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not good at emotions. So when that scene, when he does, uh, breaks my heart. Yep. yep. Same. Um, he, I think he has one of the more profound lines in, in the piece, which is that, you know, and the metaphor of course is religion. Religion doesn't change who you are, you know, like when he's talking about being able to not chomp down on somebody's neck after he gets turned into a vampire. Yeah. He's like, whatever this is, it don't change who you are. And I'm like, yep, that's religion. If you get into it and you use it as an excuse to be a fanatic and go do horrible things to other people and you use it as a, an excuse to hate that's because that's who you were before you found it. Um, and that's who you'd be without it. It's just an excuse. <laughs> the There's so many, so many big, fun, great, awesome moments in that show. And I like a, a smaller one that I think every time it happens, it just blows me away. And it's when um, Annie Flynn, she comes out of the burning house and she goes to Beverly King. She's like, you are not a good person. And I was like, get her yep yeah well yeah you, it's like she just like threw like the fists are out i was like and that's the only thing that ever i saw bev make her like take a moment back to hear annie flynn call her a bad like a bad person yeah it's great seeing her just like whoa 
That's the only thing that's ever bothered it, it's her. It's so satisfying because you're waiting for her to get her comeuppance the entire... I mean, she's not a likable character. An outstanding performance because I'm oh, sure yes. the actress is a wonderful person. If you can make me hate you that much. I hated you. Right. Yeah. Samantha <laughs> Sloyan is a wonderful, wonderful actor. And yeah. yeah. She sells it so well. Yeah. It, oh, you're right. It is very gratifying. Yeah. And uh, it's like you were saying, religion... It's something that I take very uh, dear to me because my mom was the true Christian and she was the person that like, this is what church is, but first is being good to people and taking care of your family and being a good person, you know, just being decent. And that's a a core aspect of that. And seeing um, Monsignor Pruitt, Father Paul's journey, uh, because it's someone who is misguided. It is, he a hundred percent knows he's doing the right thing. And he's like, I'm, this is my journey. This is me looking out for you. This is me saving people. Uh, forgive me father for I'm about to sin. I was like, who wrote that line? That's a good line. I <laughs> believe that's a Mike Flanagan. Line. Like that one, that Flanagan one got gets. me excited. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, to watch the perversion of religion in that show, uh, struck a chord to me and it's, it's, it's not the show that I was necessarily looking for, but it was the kind of the one I needed. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I think the show sneaks up on you. Um, you know, the first episode or two, you, if you go into it blind, you might think it's about a religious revival. And mm-hmm. then it doesn't really reveal itself until three. And then after that, it, it just continues to reveal itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you know, then you're in, you're in for a very different ride with a very different point. Um, but yeah, you know, back to, you know, Father Paul, I think that the importance of that is empathy and just trying to yeah essentially give everybody the benefit of the doubt that they're trying to do something right even if it goes wrong Mm -hmm. the only character that maybe we didn't quite nail the landing on the empathy for is probably bev because that one's real tough but those people exist and you know you meet them in a chat room and there's really no way or you see them on a picket line you know with a sign that's telling you you're gonna burn in hell like it's really hard to make a good version of that character that walks home and you know then you can really relate to we never got that to that place with bev at some at some point people go to a a spot where i'm like i can't try and like redeem you right now uh you were lost at a certain point you can come back but for me it's hard for me to that that dog didn't do nothing to you yeah Yeah. (laughs) that that for me was one of the missteps actually of bly manor was that we extended or tried to extend an explanation or an empathy for peter um, Peter Quinn, uh, Peter Quinn. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or uh, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, I, I just felt like, yeah, you know, we, I felt like that scene was letting him off the hook. I, I don't, to me, it doesn't let him off the hook, but it's good to inform, I feel, it's good to inform the audience. Like this is how he became a bad person. Like trauma or like oh, horrible treating people horrible begets, um, more negative feelings down the line. Sure. Yeah. I just wish we hadn't blamed it on his mother. It's like, here's this guy, you know, clearly gaslighting women and the source of it, we are like, is this abusive woman? You know, like that, that to me is a misstep, but you to, know, that's, to, that's only my two cents. <laughs> for, for me, when they were still trying to be like Rebecca Jessel, she was great. She was wonderful. I'm like, she was kind of not the great person. Like she started off good, but she was immediately just like going off the deep end for this. But you know, love makes you do weird things. <laughs> I suppose. Um, Midnight Mass was the, probably the first piece of your work that I watched and because Netflix is not my primary streaming service, but I'm very anti binge. Sure. Uh, I like to digest my episodes. I like my weekly episode. I like to talk about it with my friends and I watched all of Midnight Mass in one day. (laughs) Oh, wow. Um, once it got going, it really hooked me. And I did have a question about the writing of that. Um, in the writer's room, were you guys thinking pace when you wrote the episodes? Because the pacing of that show, it's kind of a slow burn at the beginning, like you said, but once it gets going, it's like you guys just jump into hyperspeed. How much of that is in the actual writing process and how much is, you know, the actor's, ad-libbing or improvising and editing. how much of it happens in, in the editing room. Yeah, so um, the writer's room for Mass was a bit unconventional. It was happening simultaneously with the writer's room for Bly Manor. As a result, Mike was kind of pulled between two worlds. The scripts in Midnight Mass didn't get finished by the time the rooms closed. And what they were left with was a couple of drafts and a couple of outlines. 
So over the course of five weeks, uh, basically, I was given the task of rewriting episodes two through seven. Mm. Uh, I had not been part of the writer's room. I was brought in after that room had closed to basically put these scripts in a better place before Mike took his pass. So in terms of pacing and all that kind of stuff, uh, it was definitely meant to be a slow burn. And I imagine that's what they had discussed in the room. Um, but I can't speak to it because, again, I wasn't in the room. I was my own room by the time I started rewriting, um, which was a crazy five week marathon. I, I pretty much just woke up, went to my laptop, wrote all day. And then went to sleep. Just lived, lived on the crock pot. Yeah, it was <laughs> insane. I, I, again, this is one of the reasons we're striking. It's pretty unheard of to ask somebody to do that, uh, especially when some of the, the rewrites were completely scrapping and writing from scratch mm. scripts or, you know, the ones that just had outlines, writing those from, you know, just an outline is that takes a lot of time. And normally you get two weeks a pop to do that. I had five weeks for five scripts. <laughs> yeah, I asked. It was cause... bonkers. My name ended up on a lot of those episodes for a reason. <laughs> yeah. And it's because I did a lot of writing on that one. Um, but yeah, it was it was bonkers. Um, it was absolutely bonkers. Sorry it was bonkers, but thank you for... Oh, hey, yeah, I'm happy to. And, you know, at the, yeah, at the end, um, you know, Mike did his pass on it and it still has the majority share of the words in that show. But the ones of mine that made it in, I am extremely proud of, especially when they're coming out of like Hamish or, or Sam or um, Katie or, yeah, you know, they, they just did such beautiful, beautiful work with it. Yeah. Um, you can tell it's incredibly personal story. Like there's no doubt about it. You know, it was really great. Yeah. Is, I'm not Catholic or nor raised Catholic. And I felt attached to it. Like it came from a very personal spot. Yeah. You could definitely feel that through it. And I think that's half the reason that I was glued to the TV so much because it felt very passionate. Yeah. You know, I, I think Mike and I were both writing from places of very intimate experience with the Catholic Church. Yeah. With this kind of family structure. And um, and then, of course, with alcoholism. Uh, we, we both kind of knew our stuff on that. So, yeah, it felt very... There wasn't a whole lot of research that we had to do because our whole lives had been researched for this project. Yeah. Um, speaking of family, I just wanted to tell you that my big sister, my little sister, uh, they're not horror people. They don't watch crazy weird stuff. And I said, y'all have to watch Midnight Mass. It's like a good, like small town, like kind of show about religion. And it really hits close to home. After episode three, Amy said, what the fuck are you making me watch right now? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> I also knew the hooks would be in so much that she would finish it. You can't it. stop then. Yeah. And okay. you know, it, it, it hits all the, the good points. I, I still have a couple things that I'm just curious about. Neil I got all the time in the world. I'm a GDQ. I'm, you know. <laughs> We're here. Uh, yeah. Was Neil Diamond in the script or was that in the editing room? My mother used to listen to Neil Diamond. I, I thought that um, might be it. And, <laughs> you know, I was not as cognizant of that because I'm three years younger than Mike. Okay. And at the time that she was really into that, I wasn't really clocking, you know, names of artists. I was like six. Um, but Mike was, you know. And so, yeah, you know, he, he took that song from... Things our mother used to listen to, and uh, the Suliban, and you know he had that Holly um, Holy, Holly that, Holy. That montage is amazing. Just give me that to eat every day. I could be a full man. <laughs> yeah, the Holly Holy montage was something Mike knew he wanted from the very beginning. Even when I went into the rewrites, he described to me what it was he wanted from that thing. I remember the first time I took a shot at writing a draft of that. Um, you know, and just finding little things to marry together, like the uh, the AA chip with the U Eucharist, the body of Christ, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. And just, you know, throwing those at him. I, I remember I sent him a message, like, like with a gif of, um, of was it Mad Max Fury Road? You know, them driving into the sandstorms, like, I'm going in. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, you know, and, and he took it and made it into something even better. Um, pretty yeah. amazing. I figured Neil Diamond must have been part of your childhood or, like, around some of the story because... It, it just feels right. And if you were to tell me my new favorite show is about Catholicism and Neil Diamond, I'd be like, I don't trust you guys. But now Holly Holy, I listen to all the time. <laughs> Brad, that's how Brad pitched it to me when he, I was like, which one should I watch first? And he's like, go with Midnight Mass. It's about Catholicism and Neil Diamond. And I was like, <laughs> sign me up. Yep. Heck of a soundtrack. And yeah, that was one Mike knew he wanted, like for sure, that, that song in that place at that time. Yeah. Now, I know another book that you and Mike have been pitching as a film, Season of Passage. Um, I'm going to break your heart. 
Is it done? Uh, we, we finished adapting it over a year ago, and Universal's not going forward with it. We took it around town, and it's not going to get made. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Fantastic book. It's a great book, and it remains from our childhood, one of our, or not even childhood, but more like our teenage years, one of our favorites. I see some DNA from Season of Passage in Midnight Mass. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Now, uh, I, I wasn't sure if that was, like, intentional. I mean, uh, going off to a faraway land, finding a vampire curse in a cave, and bringing it back home. Um, I can see that. Yeah, sure. I, I wasn't sure if that was, like... And I was thinking, like, a season of passage is going to be maybe a little too close to Midnight Mass being that, like, going away. But I also just, the thought of uh, a big sci-fi horror fantasy film. Well, if it's not getting made, perhaps I can ask you some more questions about what might have been. I don't know. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, season of passage, uh, fantastic book. You should read it. Um, I like that the book, for one, it says, like, it's about a, a celebrity doctor. I'm like, okay, you're, it is, but it's not. There's a lot going on there. It starts off, and the first thing I noticed was it says, like, this book was written in the 70s. Forgive us for, like, the idiosyncrasies. And I looked it up, and it was written in the 90s. I'm like, is Christopher Pike having a go at us, or did he write this, like, outline back then? So I think he wrote it in the 70s and sold it in the 90s. Okay. I think is the the, the trick there. You don't see big sci-fi horror enough. And, you know, I, I see, I watched Prometheus the other day. I'm like, I feel some of that. And Event Horizon pushing it to the campy spots, but I was just, uh, I was casting all the roles in my head. Uh, Jim was Hamish Linklater <laughs> and, uh, the main, uh, actress, not Jennifer. What was it? Lauren? Lauren. I saw as Kate Siegel. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I was so visual. It's so great having like actors when you're reading a book or like someone, you can kind of see them saying it, but, sure. um, I did, I was curious on your script. So it would have been a feature film. Yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. Uh, when I get to the Sastria, the Sastra and the Assyrians, I'm like, how are they going to work this in? Well, um, our approach to that was uh, we we pretty much cut any mention of them. Um, okay. The, the backstory is still essentially the same. You know, the garden and the and the sort of the wasteland, the barren land that you know the the bad guys live and the good guys live in the garden. And we were playing with this idea of you know just like the book is what happens to a place over time. The idea that, you know, the cave used to be a garden once and had been used illy and ended up ill. And, you know, so much of the book is about that in a way and sort of how resources are used and what that does. Um, but oh, for, for Tyler's context and for those that are listening, that haven't read the book. So you're in the middle of this sci-fi horror epic and it's about like um, a little bit of infidelity. It's about... Uh, profound horror and going to, you know, Mars, you're going to Mars and it's a, it's going to the unknown. It's the, the, the great unknown. It's going out on a ship and not knowing where you're going. And it's this, all this one story. And then there's these astronauts with their eyes out and what happened to the Russians and like, ah, and then there's this hard cut in the book where it's like fantasy story written by a child and I, <laughs> <laughs> no but it is in, in the book it is written by a child <laughs> which is yeah it's, it's jennifer um it's called lauren's sister expectations <gasps> oh my god and like it's a rug pull for sure i'm like yeah. janine <laughs> and creatine and i'm like okay yep so we we cut most of the mentions of that okay we, i wasn't we kept sure. in the story and and you know basically just um in the jennifer lauren conversations which are a bit um uh, how to describe that? Uh, a bit interstellar in nature, if you uh, the Nolan film and how communication worked between people on Earth and people in space. Um, in the logs that Lauren had was Jennifer telling this story in bits and pieces, because of course, uh, you know, spoiler warning: Jennifer is more hooked into that than the reality of it than anybody else is. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, without getting too spoilery, we kind of put that into the background of it and then slowly had it boil up into a reveal. But you did you have any scenes where it would actually show it? No. Okay. Um, not, not explicitly. Um, we toyed with certain things. Um, we looked at maybe doing a way to do it through animation, through something that, you know, maybe Jennifer was drawing or, you know, like uh, yeah. trying to bring it to life in that kind of style. Um, 
you know, they, they kind of did something similar to that in the remake of the Candyman with the shadow puppets, mm. you know, that, that, that tell his backstory, which I found really effective. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, and or also like on a kill bill or like the, one of those Harry Potter movies where they tell like the ancient story through like a separate animation, which is a cool way to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. But what we ended up leaning more towards was, um, a tone that was sort of like, um, how to describe it. Europa report kind of meets, uh, contact and the descent. <laughs> um, it's like a fusion of those three films that I found to, just to be captivating. Yeah. Like, the danger of it, the, uh, uh, yeah, there was a lot there that I really loved, and I, I hope that one day, you know, maybe that script does get sold, but um, it, it didn't on this round anyway. So yeah. I probably shouldn't talk too much about it if sure. it does make it out uh, there. But, but I, just, I would like to say I recommend the book, and sure. uh, I, I look forward to the movie. The ending, I was very curious as well, like what you'd go about, but we don't have to spoil that. Yeah, I can't talk about the ending uh, on the off chance it ever gets made. Um, yeah. But I will say that we... Uh, we took what was there and just like any other adaptation, we made it our own and tried to make it about something that was deeply meaningful for us. Um, so, yeah, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll serve and not disappoint if it ever does get made. And I mean, that's a great segue. This book, Season of Passage, was written by Christopher Pike. And Christopher Pike is known for a lot of uh, YA, um, kind of young adult horror. And so I... That was my context going into Season of Passage. And the first scene is like a pretty intense, like, rape uh, nightmare. Yeah, and we, we, I was like, we did cut all of the rape. Okay. Uh, all of it. Uh, we just didn't see it as a narrative boon, you know, or an, 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 a necessity to tell that story. Yeah, it's, something it's, that graphic really needs to serve a purpose for the story. Yeah. And not, it's hard to do that and not feel gratuitous, I would guess. Yeah, we just, it didn't, you know, it didn't sing for us and it didn't feel necessary. So we, kinda, yeah. And the story still worked without it. <laughs> Shockingly, right? Um, <laughs> the sex in that, the sex uh, aspects of that book is odd. And it's, you know, the book is very like referential to Dracula and a few other things. And I see where you're going. I see where you're coming from, Chris. But like a lot of it was kind of out there too. And yeah. Is so it I odd because it's told through like the lens of a YA? novel this well it's not YA, but that, that oh. was my context oh, going okay. in so that first scene i was, I was like, gonna say how do yeah. you start a ya book with a rape scene that's gotta be yeah we um, tall order it's a tough one we just we leaned away from that entirely and most of the any kind of sexual stuff in them we just didn't really find a place for it yeah um, yeah okay well i'm i won't try and pry any more information okay. <laughs> as much as i'd like to i'll just borrow the book from you you definitely should it's a very good book um, but Christopher Pike, uh, was the kind of a lot of the source material for the most recent series, uh, Midnight Club. Yeah. A fantastic little horror anthology thing. Oh, thanks. Unfortunately, only one season. Unfortunately, only one season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was the, I mean, was this something that you and Mike were like, let's do Christopher Pike. Let's kind of lean into that. Uh, it was more Mike, you know, okay. I, I was not involved with the green lighting of Midnight Club in any way. That was just something that Mike He's loved the book for ages. He wanted to make it into a feature a while back. And yeah, you know, uh, then got it pitched as a series. And, you know, it, it it was pretty much that. It was what if what if the Midnight Club, but also anthology. And yeah. that, that got it sold. And then it was the writer's room job to figure out how to make that work um, and what to adapt, where to put it. Whose characters, which story, you know, uh, who, yeah. Yeah, that all of that was writer's room stuff. And it was probably one of the most difficult rooms I've ever worked in just because it was um, it was so many stories and so many characters. And they were talking about making it ongoing, which I have never really liked that idea. Uh, <laughs> it just felt like if you're making a story about dying children, a limited series is enough. Um, I feel like yeah. multiple seasons in Brightcliff, while we could have had an ending to some of those tales, I'm like, uh, it would feel forced. Yeah. And, and eventually exploitative. If we're just, you know, telling stories of dying children season after season after season, then replacing them with more dying children. This ain't Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not like they regenerate into, you know, somebody amazing. They, they just, but yeah, you know, uh, what a unique story, uh, Midnight yeah. Club, uh, a hospice for young adults, for teenagers, for young people that haven't had a chance to live their life yet. Just like trying to make me cry, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, that's 
it's interesting like the impetus for moving into like young adult horror it's like the audience it's kind of throwing out a really wide net though but um i guess uh what who, who was like the audience you were aiming for kind of when you were young adults it? i guess yeah um that was the idea you know netflix had stranger things and so they were very excited about any kind of show that featured young adults as protagonists and yeah. uh you know um and uh, maybe teens would be a better way to say that. Uh, and, you know, something that had a supernatural aspect to it as well. And this ticked both those boxes. And it was kind of a struggle, I think, to balance that. Um, because, you know, originally when we went in to write it, there was no cult, um, mm. you know. And uh, it was, you know, more about the stories that these kids told each other were our genre moments, our escape moments from the the very difficult lives that these kids were living in this very you know specific situation that was very grounded. And then, you know, uh, as you make compromises on a show, you, you try to give um, the producers what they want um, to an extent to keep everybody happy. And, yeah, you know, it just kept getting bumped further and further in this direction of what is the supernatural element in our A story. And it used to be there isn't one until the very, very end. The only supernatural thing in the A story is supposed to be the... Uh, the mended statue, as it is in the book, which you know drops oh, really? like a, you know it hits you like a, a ton of bricks because there is no supernatural element before it. Yeah, that's what makes it work. It's you know the uh, a loud a loud shout is only a loud shout in relative silence. Yeah, but and since it's... we boiled and just shot out all this supernatural stuff in the A story, by the time that happens, with the it loses its impact. It lo entirely loses its impact. Yes. Yeah, so when I when I kind of felt that happening in the room and, uh, you know, we, we had, we had conversations about it. It, it was a very difficult show to keep on the rails. Um, but you know, uh, these things are collaboration. You do your best. Um, and you were a co co-producer for that one. Yeah. Again, titles are largely meaningless in the new writing epoch. I was in the <clears> room <throat> helping shape the series as it was being written and then after the room closed, as with Midnight Mass, uh, a lot of it was rewritten. So after I got sent home, you know, like uh, the cult didn't exist in my in the version that I had worked on with no the, Paragon, no Paragon. Yeah, um, there had been a, of course, Midnight Club mentioned in the past. You know, the, another group of people who had essentially tried to find that cure for death, but there there wasn't actually like anybody around looking for ley lines or talking about the supernatural. There was no wig pull you know, mm. reveal of Stanton's part of a cult. Like Stanton was just a person. Julia Jane was just a person. They weren't actually, Julia Jane wasn't stalking the place under an assumed name. She was just brought in at the end to prove that magical thinking wasn't real. And yeah, you know, sometimes, like I said, these things get away from you. Um, and, you know, different people have different opinions on this. And I imagine maybe, maybe even Mike and I will disagree on this. I don't know. I haven't talked to him too much about this. I'm probably speaking out of turn. But, um, yeah, you know, in terms of the direction that that show ultimately went, I feel like we missed it. But that's just me. Sure. Uh, I mean, there, there are so many moments that, that stand out as big, big for me. Uh, when we wound up watching it, my wife and I, it was right after we got married, we went and rented a cabin, intensely storming right by the lake. And we just wound up watching like three midnight clubs in a row with just like this epic storm. And it was, you know, sometimes it hits hits in the right ways but yeah i could i see where you're coming from because after coming off the highs of you know hill house and then bly manor and then midnight mass it it just i i wasn't sure if the i was the audience uh that was intended because it did it's it younger. seemed a little more pulpy a little more yeah, youthy and if, if when you mentioned like netflix was like kind of wanting you know this a little more of this i can see that yeah it was a ya show you know they wanted ya and you know young audiences yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know there was one character you particularly clung to and fought for, and that yeah. was Anya. Yeah, I got in a lot of trouble for that one. Did, you um, did? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, we'd, we'd already broken a version of that episode, and it basically had Anya living in a dreamland where every day was perfect, and then eventually uh, she kept getting notifications that other kids in the Midnight Club were dying. Uh, you know, that was her fantasy before death, and... I don't know. I've had a not the most easy run at life, and I identify with Anya and a lot of. Um, I think a lot of her feeling of ostracization, and yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, I um, 
I was like a person in that position um, who, as a result of that, has so much self doubt. I don't think that they have a. Uh, I don't think they have that in them to have a fantasy land where everything is perfect, even in death, even in a moment where they're asleep. Because when I sleep, I don't see perfection at all. I mm -hmm. see a lot of worries made manifest. So I argued pretty passionately for um, a version of uh, Anya's sort of dream world where she was essentially living in a her own judgment of herself made manifest bit by bit and piece by piece and that we could let the midnight club kind of break through that and give her peace before she goes because she can't give it to herself she's incapable and i think that's the beauty of the show that we did make is it's going to sound really lame but the power of friendship um and what other people bring into our lives which is usually a a better view of ourselves than we might have. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just that idea of not being alone. I think Anya felt even in a room full of people, probably alone all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I worked on that one and, um, I, I kind of pitched the room that I had a different idea for the first 30 minutes of that episode. And, you know, when you're moving along at, at a room's pace, um, that's kind of a dick move. Um, on my part, everyone's like, we're doing this. We're moving. Exactly. Like, we got to stop. Uh, yeah. We're it, going no, back. Nobody likes to hear somebody say, I want to change everything we did. Um, and they were all very gracious and very patient through gritted teeth and maybe a mean email or two. Not mean means the wrong word. Maybe a, a strongly worded email, an honest email, an honest email, I think would be the better one. Yeah. Basically like saying, you know, if this is what you want to do, we will, we will, back you essentially, but we'll also, you know, letting you know that this is not cool. Um, and then, uh, I was given a weekend to mock something up. And so I wrote the first 30 pages of that episode in two days and they largely didn't change from what I wrote. Um, I am extremely proud of that 30 minutes. Um, yeah. And I, I just think that Ruth Codd is an exceptional actor. Who oh yeah. Managed to sell that in a way that I could only dream of her phone conversation with Rhett is again, you know, it's the opposite. It's the anti Danny Jamie scene. If Danny Jamie is, you know, a moment of comfort between two people that is awkward, you know, the, the Rhett and Anya phone scene is a moment of complete apathy between two people who have every reason to be kind to each other after what they've been through. Yeah. And that was a really hard scene to write, but it's also an easy one to write because it's the fear of reconnecting with someone that you hurt. And it's putting yourself out there. Yep. The nightmare oh. version of how they might react to you, which is apathy and blame. Yeah. It's, I would have liked to have seen more Anya. And uh, I've, I've read about where season two could have gone, and it would have been great to see Anya's character living on in Alonka's uh, stories. And yeah, the Remember Me track. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, I was happy that I could at least read where some of it would have gone. And yeah, that's a lot of beautiful characters. And I really enjoyed the show. I'm glad. And I'm glad that Mike came out and gave that to everyone just because, you know, ending a show without closure, I feel is especially cruel, you know, like, yeah, I and mean, networks are doing it, you know, like they did it to dark or not dark. Um, what was it? Uh, 1899. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me they're in outer space and stop. How, how could Oh, we just, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? They're in outer space and you just stop? Yeah. They're yeah. really shooting themselves in the foot with that, too, because I know a lot of people that won't, if I recommend a show to them, they won't even start watching it until it's got a couple seasons because they're like, why would I want to get invested in something that's not renewed? I don't want to, if it's just going to, if it's not going to resolve itself, I'm not going to commit to it. So, yeah. And that's always a, it's like, you, you got to watch it anyway, though, because I'm telling you, it's so good. Yeah. 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 Uh, speaking of Ruth Cott, uh, <laughs> I know she's at least making an appearance in the fall of the House of Usher, so I will use that as a segue. Uh, oh, I got a fun announcement I could drop on you guys. <laughs> we won't say no. Okay, yeah, yeah. So she's definitely in the fall of the House of Usher. Um, but she is also um, in my episode of Creep Show for season four. She is one of the two leads in it, and the other is Samantha Sloyan. Whoa. And it's basically... Nice. Basically, 30 minutes of real time where the two of them are in a house together. That's I, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. 
Do do we know when this is coming out? Uh, I don't. I keep waiting for them to drop it. I've seen um, a cut of the episode. I loved it. Um, you know, it's it's finalized. It's done. It's just a matter of when they're going to release it. And I would assume October because it's been a while. You know, we wrapped shooting ages ago. Um, what what does Creepshow come out on? Oh, uh, Shutter. It's AMC. on Shutter. Okay. And I know they've you know Shutter's had some problems, and AMC has. You know, had had some challenges there too. So I don't know if this got caught up in that mm. or what. But I, I do know that they've shot the season and they've, you know, uh, they've they finished mixing. So these things should be ready to come out as soon as um, the networks are ready to release them. Maybe okay. they're waiting for spooky time. Spooky time of year. That would make sense. It would be neat to have um, Usher and Creepshow land in the same few weeks. That would be very fun. Yeah, be exciting time. Very good time to be Ruth Codd as well, because I <laughs> feel like Ruth is going to take over the world. She's a wonderful person and a great actor, and she deserves more roles. And more uh, uh, Samantha Sloyan as well. Always a good thing. Always a Always good a good thing. I remember going back to Hill House. I'm like, oh, she's so nice and sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's um, back to Oculus, too. And I'm like, she's a good friend. She's a great person. I need to not remember her as Beverly Keene in my head. (laughs) Yeah, she's in Hush, too. You know, she's the neighbor. Yeah, Hush, yeah. Neighbor friend. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, she's great. Um, So you wrote for one episode for Creepshow? I did, yeah. Okay. They basically do that. Uh, They just grab random writers and they're like, pitch us, you know, three sentences of what this is. And if uh, they like the three sentences, they bring you on and write a script. Uh, do we know the three sentences? Can we say those? No, I can't. Okay, no, that's well, cool. Unfortunately, I, I can't do that. Uh, that would be spoiler territory. It's called the turn of the screw, and we're going <laughs> to... <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> this time, we're going to make it really ambiguous. Um, yeah. um, no, I can't talk about it beyond the fact that it exists. It's coming out. Um, and that those are our actors, and that I adore them both, and that they did an incredible job. I will say that uh, there's a monster in it that I'm ex- incredibly proud of. Um, mm. and that if you're a fan of Blind Manor, especially, okay, you might recognize the origin of this monster. Um, that's, I'll leave it there. I won't pry <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as much as I want to. Um, and what can you tell us about the fall of the house of Usher? Uh, Is it, I just, I've seen the cast and I'm like, ah, everybody's there. Meh. And then I, I know it's about Edgar Allan Poe, which I haven't read any of his works. So, uh, at this point though, I'd rather watch the show. And then go, I don't want to be spoil anything, so. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just echo things Mike has already said here to stay out of trouble. Though I feel like they'll probably never work with me again after what I said about Midnight Club. But, um, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, can ed- we can edit if you no, want. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, uh, yeah you know, um, uh, it's Mike taking on a sort of a giallo style of, of horror, which is, you know, a bit more... Uh, flashy and bloody and gory, Ooh. and uh, so it's mm, right it's down very my fun. alley. Yeah, he, it's, got, he was all about Evil Dead Rise. <laughs> oh man, I think this might be the the Flanagan series for you then. Um, <laughs> yeah, this one's very bloody um, and a whole lot of fun, uh, which is not something that we normally say about our series. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's as far as I want to go with describing it to to stay safe. But is it, it modernized? Is it contemporary? Contemporary, yeah. Um, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. I'll but. say nothing. Okay. <laughs> when, did, one. when did you uh, did you say that one might come out this fall? Uh, September, October. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right around the corner, so you won't have to wait long for the answers no. to these questions. And you'll know from the uh, the first trailer. You're like, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, it'll it'll announce itself very quickly as as to what it is. Good, good, mm-hmm. good. I'm very excited. For yes, that one. but it is a Poe anthology. I mean, that much is clear. We we took you know Fall of the House of Usher, and then we. You know, similarly to other projects, we we tackled a lot of other Poe stories and found ways to kind of weave them in and out. I haven't read much Poe, but I know at least three or four of the the big ones, you know, the ones that everybody knows. You know, oddly enough, my biggest knowledge of Edgar Allan Poe comes from The Lady Killers with Tom Hanks. Oh, wow. Have you seen that film? I haven't. It's a Coen Brothers comedy, and he's obsessed with Poe. You should just watch it because you've been thinking about Poe a lot lately, probably. But <laughs> it's the Coen Brothers' like least loved film, and it's one of my favorite comedies they made, which is th- their mastery of language is just bizarre. Yeah, uh, well, I guess I have one last question about some of your work, and it's just speculation fun. What do you think happened to Warren Flynn and Lisa Scarborough as they <laughs> sailed away from the crock pot and? The fire and the massacre. Oh, the bad answer is uh, per Salem's lot, they become vampire hunters. That's the that's the bad sequel. Um, <laughs> you know, um, well, the vampires are gone, right? Hopefully, all the angels of 
Yeah. yeah. Man, I'm getting excited about Midnight Mass again. When he's doing the Angel of God, my guardian dear prayer, it's like, I, the first time I didn't get it because I, I was still like, it just didn't click. But now I'm like, that's my favorite prayer now because he's just praying to. Yep. 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 He's I, just like, please come deliver blood to me to make me feel better. That, yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite prayer because I was able to say it so fast. But um, <laughs> yeah. So one the one path is they become vampire hunters. Oh, I hate that one. Um, the that, <laughs> These are all kind of jokes. You know, the, the sure. joke of season two is, is that I think Rahul Kohli made this joke is that it would just be um, a dust pan and a broom (laughs) 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 what mop them all up um yeah but what happens to them after this i think you know uh they're old enough that they could probably probably go out and survive on their own but yeah you know i I imagine that they'd be taken in by the authorities they'd have to because they're they're underage right so they'd be separated yeah 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 uh, and yeah you know probably fostered for a minute there and then uh you know the whole world would have to kind of reckon with the sort of Croatoan Jamestown mystery of what happened to a whole island full of people. There'd be horrible documentaries all over everywhere about yep. it. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you know, if, uh, if it was another series, then of course the vampire would have somehow made it to the other side or, you know, flown it's, across the thing. It's like, like uh, he did make it. Yeah. He's just fine. The cutting of the wings didn't do anything. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, that's, that's the bad version of it. Yeah, is. I think any sequel to Midnight Mass is a bad version of yeah, the sequel. If, if you figured it out, yeah. yeah, people are like, "We want Breaking Bad season six. I'm like, "Why? It's done. It's <laughs> perfect. Let it rest." Yeah, yeah, like what would the mystery of a new Midnight Mass season be? There'd, there'd be nothing. Under the the metaphor is dead. Yeah, it's, cats out of the bag now. Yeah, I had a horrible idea for a sequel to season of Passage <gasps> while I was reading it, and it would be after the 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 stuff gets back to Earth. And then the second movie would be like a traditional like vampire hunter horror movie with our main character uh, being Lauren's boyfriend, uh, Terry. And I'm like, sounds horrible. But like the transition from sci fi to like more traditional like John Carpenter's vampires. I'm like, I I couldn't do it. But I'm like, I could see that being like a sequel, like make it into two because that ending. I'm like, I don't know. That's a tricky one to stick. Yeah. No comment. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. did you have any other questions about the work or anything? Um, yeah, actually. Um, so I saw that you had writing credits on episode five. Oh, of Mass? Yes, of Mass. Yeah. And that particularly is probably my favorite episode of it because of the end of that episode with Riley. Yeah. Um, how how did, uh, did you know that was going to be the end of his character kind of going into it? Or did you find that along the way? Cause it seems almost too perfect. Yeah. That was something that Mike came to, um, and figured out, I think while the writer's room was still going, was that it was ultimately not going to come down to a showdown between two men, but two women. Uh, but that hadn't been the original plan. Riley was supposed to be the protagonist and was supposed to make their way through the story. Mike and I had done an adaptation of uh, Venice underground that pulled a very similar trick of switching protagonists. And it's a risky move. Uh, People do not like it when you tell them you're going to switch antagonists. Yeah. Uh, Especially um, people on the executive side. I find it fascinating and great. And this was a case where, you know, Mike, you know, he he figured out a great way to do it. Um, This was something that I can take no credit for. It was done before I ever came into the room and did a rewrite. Um, and those scenes, those um, Aaron and um, yeah, the, the, those scenes together, Aaron Riley in the boat mm-hmm. are very Mike. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of Carl Sagan in there. There's a lot of. Gotta love the Sagan. Yep. yep. And Mike loves Carl Sagan. Uh, very, very much so. It's about four years of my life. I read every, every Sagan thing. Yeah. I was going to say Season of Passage had a lot of Sagan in it the yeah. way we did it. <laughs> and a lot of the, the, the monologue uh, where they're talking about what happens after death and like returning to the stars. I'm like. I read this. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I I've felt this before. The campfires in the sky. Yeah. Is Carl Sagan. Yeah. That is, that is right out of Carl Sagan, right out of Cosmos. So not only is it hitting my small town Catholicism, it's got my Sagan in there. And I guess I'm a Neil Diamond person now. So yeah. yeah all good things. <laughs> but yeah, that, that, um, that change to making it more about, yeah, making it, uh, making Aaron our, our protagonist was one that they came up with before I was ever involved, but definitely a very Mike, um, very Mike move and a great one at that. Yeah. Well, the piece that you see Riley achieve 
and then the hard cut of her just screaming is just so impactful in the edit the editing of that is just fantastic it's a great scene yeah a great way to end an it episode really stuck with me after the episode and like i said i watched it all in one day so i powered through the rest of the show but even going into like you know the finale and shit's really hitting the fan like downtime in between scenes i just went back to think about that one yeah you know and it feels true to riley's nature as an addict that he recognizes that this can't be the movie 30 days of night where he becomes an all powerful force of good that at the end of the day, if there's one thing that this person can't reliably do, it's make it through the day without denying their basest urges. And that's addiction in a nutshell is you, you fight every day to not do the thing that you feel compelled to do. And, you know, when you add stressors to that, um, yeah. People often collapse, and that's why I love Riley's last lines was, you know, I, I did my best, you know? I, I, I had a horrible joke come into my head when they, like... Go when, for it, please. When, Gallows when, humor. Let's when he it. was being given um, the blood the first time in front of Beverly and Sturge and uh, Monsignor Pruitt, I just imagine going, the blood of Sturge instead of the blood of Christ. <laughs> I'm like, you're being promised salvation with the blood of Christ, and you're getting the blood of Sturge. Like, <laughs> this this is a uh, Hydrox Oreos or something. Yeah, it does seem kind of like the, uh, yeah, you know, you, you walked into like a Wawa or something like that. You know. <laughs> we got Sturge. You could take it yeah. or leave it. Sturge, uh, extra caffeine. I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, that actor, Matt Bledel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy he... Went on to Midnight Club, and I know he's going to be an usher. Yep. Uh, talking about the end of that episode, though, I hate that Netflix says, uh, start next episode, three, two, one. Because if you listen to the credits, it's her character, it's Aaron screaming sobbing. and sobbing yeah. and still like processing it. I'm like, the credits are supposed to be experienced. If the music is hanging, um, not only do we need to see the creators, we also like that's part of the experience and the art and to have Netflix just always rush through credits. Yeah. And I usually try and panic and stop it. And then I skip it and or something. And I'll, all my remote, it's just twice up on the little pad. And then it's I can listen to the credits because that one you need to unwind from. I was like, I need to go grab a beer, make some popcorn. I got to let that sit for a minute. It's like at the, um, what was not X, the may, may, the prequel to X that they just made. Oh, yeah. Pearl. Pearl. Yeah. yeah. The credits scene where like the credits she's is smiling. just her, like yeah. trying to fake a <laughs> smile and convince herself she's happy. I'm just like, holding you, it. Yeah. You need it. You need those credits. I yeah. like my credits. And it's, not for those silly, stupid Marvel things. Uh, there's like. There's experiences uh, part of it. Yeah. I agree. And um, I do know that for a minute, a hot minute, they managed to uh, they managed to make it so that it didn't just move on to the next thing. Um, they, they Netflix finally was like, let it let it play out. I don't know if that's still the case now. Yeah. For a minute there, they have that. Well, I know with Max or what, what HBO was doing, they were even taking off individual credits on the shows and just saying yeah, like creator. creator. <laughs> yep. I, was, I was like, why would you? upset everybody yeah it's <laughs> what, really, who are you we're doing this for i guess i'm a creator now um yeah you know created by is a very specific credit you yeah. know with a very specific uh set of criteria uh you can't just give that to anyone who directed anyone who wrote you know it created by is a very serious credit so to to see yeah. everyone be like created by everybody i guess it's just like <laughs> oh really are you gonna pay me like a creator okay yeah <laughs> it's just it's, like <laughs> it's, it's just it's also just good to have a context like who is who did this? Who did that? And yeah. you get to appreciate someone's uh, career of work when you know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a very, you know, all of our jobs are so specific. It's important that they be credited accurately, you know, for, in terms of just delineating writing, producing, uh, directing, all that kind of stuff. You, you got to know kind of who did what um, for sure. It's helpful. Um, I got one more. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, just for the road. Uh, could you throw out a couple recommendations for my selfish use or for our listeners, some uh, horror movies? And I guess they don't have to be horror movies, but some good flicks that movies, you've seen. shows, and books, please. There you if go. You have oh, any. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of uh, movies, A Tale of Two Sisters. Uh, you, I've heard you mention this one before. Yeah, go find it. it. It remains gorgeous. It's got the cinematography of The Shining, but with this beautiful, like, fairy, not a folktale story almost, like, like um, 
But yeah. not the remake. No, God, not the uninvited. Don't, don't <laughs> no. do it. If the version of this you're watching begins with a beach house blowing up, run. Hit, hit stop. Get out of there. But this is like a weird opening to a video beach house blowing up. Okay. Like, I can hear the studio note being like, this is a very quiet story about two sisters in a house together with an evil stepmother. What, if, like, they, yeah. what if it blew up in the first yeah, shot? What, what if the first shot is just an explosion? <laughs> it's really got everybody's attention. You're like, it completely undermines everything. Cut to a motorcycle and a yeah. shotgun. Exactly. A That's tale of two sisters. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so tale of two sisters, um, the artifice girl, uh, was a recommendation from my brother that absolutely got me. Another feature, again, recommended by Mike that completely got me is You Won't Be Alone. You Won't Be Alone is uh, tackles horror and gender in a way that uh, very few films ever have. And is one of my all-time favorite films, top five easily now. And a, a, oh wow, yeah, it's it's great. Um, I, I remember you mentioning a film on Twitter the other day that I've seen. I forget the name of it. Where the girl's trying to commune with the dead, and she has a priest, and they lock uh, not a, a a man, and they lock themselves in a, a dark house. song. A dark song. That one I remember loving. That's great too. Yeah, yeah. it's a. Uh, uh, oh, Liam Gavin. Yeah, um, it's such a, a quiet small film yep. until the end, and. It sticks a very difficult landing, I think. Yeah, and the, the way they do this, the subtle special effects and like the subtle cinematography uh, and the giant like. Yep, I know exactly what you're referring to. And everyone should go run to see that movie. Uh, and it, you, you can stream it pretty much anywhere, I think. But yeah, Dark Song is so good. Uh, moving on to, to two uh, shows, Marianne um, as uh, one season and done. French horror uh, is great. You can find that on Netflix. Uh, the Terror, season one especially, oh, on AMC. so good. I haven't seen it. That's fantastic. All, m probably my all-time favorite one season of a show. Um, season one of that show, it's an anthology, so season two is completely unrelated. But the okay. first season is an adaptation of a Dan Simmons novel, and uh, it's, it's kind of, so well done. Yeah, the atmospheric exploration of crafty and horror is just yep. the perfect stew for that. I need more cosmic horror in my life. Yeah, oh my God. Now's a good time to go back and revisit Rome uh, for Ray Stevenson, um, who passed away. Mm -hmm. He played Titus Polo and was so wonderful in that show. Um, those are the big three shows I'll, I'll throw out for the moment. Um, in terms of books, um, I am reading and adoring Whale Fall right now. Whale Fall. Uh, okay. That comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and, yeah, uh, let me... Pull this up here. Uh, the, <laughs> the book comes out in a couple weeks. Yeah, I've got a, I've got an, an advanced copy. Cool. Um, and it was very very kind. I met the author uh, last year at StokerCon, which comes up in about a week or two. And yeah, you know, it's um it's Daniel Krauss, um who's worked on things like uh, Shape of Water and uh, and want to hear my bad name for Shape of Water? Yeah, please. Grinding Nemo. <laughs> I like it. Sorry. Um, no, it's good. Uh, but the basic premise of this is uh, there's a diver and they get swallowed by a whale. And love, yeah, I love me some Pinocchio. So. Uh, so if you've ever wanted to, you know, read a survival horror slash deeply personal father son relationship story, hmm. uh, Whale Fall is the way to go. It is so far one of the best books I've I've read all year. Um, it's real good. I'm excited for um, that. Yeah, going to be real neat. Other books that I really, really like. <laughs> I'm going to throw this out there just because I really like the book, but I hate myself for doing it because I know it'll probably never be finished. But uh, The Name of the Wind, fantasy, you know, um, Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, there are two books written out of the trilogy. The third one, The Doors of Stone, all of uh, all of our fantasy nerd culture has been waiting for now for far too long. And it's it's going like the the Winds of Winter route, where it's Oof. just never going to be released. Uh, those words are not allowed to be said around me. Winds of Winter. <laughs> I, I don't want to throw this table. Brad gets very I can't upset. lift this table up, so I will be really frustrated. <laughs> then Listen, you throw your back. I remember, reading, I remember reading speculation about it coming out 10 years ago on Reddit. I'm like, yeah. I'm sure tomorrow's the day. <laughs> yep, same with Doors of Stone. You know, for years now, they've been like, any time now. And it's just, nope, no. Then you, you know, you... Also, <sighs> mad props to authors for doing what they want. I'm yeah. George R. R. Martin, you can do what you want. Yeah, and it's just really hard for me at the same time. Please, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to disparage anybody, you know, especially the author, because I love the work that they put out there, and I am not entitled to their work. And yeah. Stephen King took a long time off on Dark Tower to come back to it and then knock it out of the park. So you know, take the time you need to write the thing and write it well. Um, 
But man, would I love to read that third book. Um, and I, yeah, those are the two books I'll stick with for the moment. Yeah. I would have a recommendation or something. I'm curious if you've seen Ermentari. Ermentari? No, I have not. It's a, I think it's a German film. It's a foreign film about a blacksmith who catches a demon. Oh. And it's fucking like old school. And I wouldn't spoil anything else, but I, it's just so stylish. And it just feels like such an old fairy tale. And it is just beautiful and heavy metal. And he won't let the demon go. I'll just say that. Uh, very good. And yeah, Edimentari is what it's called. And have you ever read Fever Dream? No. It's a, it's a gothic horror novel by George R. R. Martin about uh, riverboats and vampires. Oh. And the protagonist is like a 50-year-old dude. And I'm like, good for you, man. Heck yeah. 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 It's, it's not a 20-year-old uh, handsome person. And it's like, it's like this retired guy is like, I don't want to sail anymore. And they're like, we have one more job for you. I guess so. It's kind of that like, yeah. they pull me back in. The reluctant hero. But I, I love uh, gothic novels. And I love that, that setting and that tone. And I yeah. love vampires. And I don't know what it is about me loving riverboats. Because I've never been on one. But they just seem so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that one's good too, but Amazing. Is, there, is there any genres you'd want to write for? You haven't had a chance, a specific oh, genre? Man. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I've been writing for this show, <coughs> pardon me, called Hysteria, Yeah, uh, which is kind of a um, satanic panic YA 80s thriller um, that's being filmed, was being filmed in Atlanta. I think uh, the uh, WGA picketers just got them yesterday, so I think mm. production just stopped. Okay, but um, a lot of that, a lot of that one's you know interspersed with comedy, and uh, I have a lot of fun writing comedy. It turns out I had no idea because um, you don't get to write a lot of that in the Flanniverse. Not that any of us like the term the Flanniverse. Please don't use it. I, I tried. I tried not to. I mean, you did. Yeah. Well, shame on you. <laughs> I know it's horrible. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I really enjoy writing comedy. It's it's kind of fun, um, and I would love to work more in that genre. And then just in general, um, character dramas, something like Better Call Saul would definitely be my speed because it's about people who are, you know, basically their own worst enemies. Broken and, and trying. Yep. That's that's most of the people I know and most of the people I've been. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'd just say thanks one more time for your, your work. Uh, horror is a, a genre that I was feeling uninspired by for a long time and... Uh, the films, uh, the shows that you've worked on uh, are cathartic horror, which is a unique vehicle for catharsis horror because a lot of it can just not be about that, but to experience something with a character. And it's like uh, they say in you know Blind Manor, it's a love story. And just because uh, a lady got locked in a, in a thing for a while with some clothes, like uh, it's actually a, it's meant to deliver you somewhere at the end. And uh, I, I just love horror that makes you feel good things at the end, which is a tricky, plane, to do. a tricky plane to land. And yeah. uh, successfully, you've done it so much. So thank you for all of your work. Hey, well, on behalf of Mike and uh, me and the legion of writers who have written on all these shows, I just want to say thank you for watching, and it means the world. Oh, absolutely. Keep pumping them out. I'm going to keep watching. Deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and thanks for joining us. If uh, We've literally just talked about all of the stuff you've been on, but if people wanted to, I mean, you're, you have a Twitter, if people wanted to like follow you. Oh or like, man, I mean, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, but I mostly just post stuff about, you know, trans rights and I, I rail at conservatives. I don't know that you want to follow me there, but if you do, uh, yeah, you can find me at Twitter on Jay Flanagan or at Jay Flanagan 81. If you haven't seen any of these things or experienced any of the Flanniverse. Uh, <laughs> You open the door, I'm kicking it in, buddy. Oh, it's horrible. It's so horrible. <laughs> um, but no, check out these shows. Uh, check out uh, Hysteria when it comes out. Check out Creep Show. Uh, check out Season of Passage just to get people excited for and tweet and demand a movie. <laughs> get people angry. Kick doors down about that because I'd love to see it. And uh, yeah, this has been Popcorn Dogs. And we are just so happy to have you here today. So thanks again. Well, thanks for having me, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thanks, guys. That was Hey everyone, thanks for checking out that wonderful discussion we just had with Jimmy Flanagan. Uh, wanted to remind everyone that yes, the Hair of the Dogcast is part of the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Make sure to check out all those other amazing shows. And I wanted to thank our executive producers, Brian Ward, Ryan Christianick, Tyler Keller, Jordan Hoff, and the wonderful Phil. 
Um, Philip, we, we appreciate all of you so much. You make this show possible. If you want access to this and other shows, make sure to check out patreon.com slash hair of the dog cast. You'll get access to such exclusive episodes as the lore of McDonald land, uh, Eldon dogs, Wayne advance, as well as a lot of popcorn dogs, including our episode. We just recorded about midnight mass. So if you want to know more about our feelings about midnight mass, Tyler and I have a nice long discussion about it. We'd love so much to have you join us. There is a free trial option. If you're curious, just want to check it out. But yes, thanks again for listening to the episode and we will uh, see you next time.